As promised, I'm having a follow-up conversation with Professor Norman Finkelstein. He is the author of The Holocaust Industry. He's the author of Beyond Chutzpah. He's the author of many other texts, but most recently, I'll burn that bridge when I get to it. It is a book that tackles academic freedom, cancel culture, uh, and perhaps the, the most recent spate of politically correct authors on topics such as race. And that's what we're going to be covering on this show. We're going to be discussing some of these authors, Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, Kimberly uh, Crenshaw, but specifically Robin DiAngelo and Ibram X. Kendi. And uh, before we even get to the specifics of their books, uh, I guess the big elephant in the room would be whenever you do uh, read modern day texts on race and racism, one thing that comes up again and again is this idea that there is no biological basis for uh, race or racism, which to me, it just strikes me as totally wrong. First of all, uh, you could imagine a, a racism even without race in the sense that you could have, for instance, prehistoric groups growing up in a certain village, 10 miles over, there's another village that if you get caught, you know, without a family or friends, you might get killed. They might look exactly like you. They might sound exactly like you, uh, but maybe they dress a little bit differently, or maybe their linguistic patterns are a little bit different. And you can imagine how this gets transferred over to seemingly far less consequential things, such as what, what your physical appearance is like, right? Especially in, let's say, like a very diverse kind of city. Just just thinking about how they present race and racism, uh, do, uh, d does it cohere with your idea of maybe how racism develops? Like there's a class component to it, obviously, there's a biological component, but how do you view uh, race and racism yourself? Just let's say growing up in a very diverse uh, place like Brooklyn, you've been a, a New York City resident, resident your whole life. I've been in your City resident for the vast majority of my life. So maybe we could just kind of start with our uh, differing approaches uh, compared to Ken or D'Angelo here. Well, first of all, I'm very conservative on questions having to do with science, which is to say I don't speak on them unless I have uh, the requisite knowledge and actually more than the requisite knowledge, having an expert knowledge. I don't possess it and I don't pretend to possess it. I have talked to people in the various relevant disciplines in biology and evolutionary biology in particular, I have asked their opinions and um, in particular about the question which is most uh, salient, namely the relationship between race and intelligence. Now, uh, basically <clears throat> the people I've discussed the matter with, I'll name one uh, because I don't think he will have trouble with me attributing, ascribing uh, any words to him, uh, probably the, the currently one of the greatest living evolutionary biologists, Robert Trivers, happens to be an old friend of mine. And I've had, had several conversations out of curiosity where he stands on the issue of <clears throat> race. Uh, incidentally, Robert Trivers uh, was, I think, the only white member of the Black Panther Party. And what he's co authored articles with Huey Newton. And one of his books is dedicated to Huey Newton. For those of you who don't know, Huey Newton was one of the leading figures in the Black Panther Party. So he has a he has an odd uh, career trajectory, but he won the equivalent of the Japanese Nobel. And he's, uh, by any reckoning, first rank. He said to me that race was at some point in time, probably a useful uh, uh, scientific concept but now races are so intermixed that he said it no longer has uh, scientific value. Uh, and I'm, as I said, perfectly happy to defer to him uh, on that subject. I've talked to uh, top, one of the top scientists in the world. He happens to be in computer science, but he knows science, he knows science. And uh, I asked his opinion and about the relationship between race and uh, intelligence. And his, he was just so dismissive of the idea. He wasn't dismissive in a politically correct way. He's a scientist, he's a very serious scientist. <laughs> I'll even give his name because I don't think he'll like. His name is um, Mihalis Yanakakis. And he's over at Columbia University uh, by any, by any conventional standing, he's one of the great living scientists in the world with all the medals and all the awards. 
Uh, and he was dismissive of it, as I said, not in a politically correct way, like, oh, how can you say that? That's so you know, racist and blah, blah, blah. No, he said it's, uh, uh, he just didn't attach any significance to that concept. And then I asked my college roommate from many eon ago, who uh, was, uh, was in biomathematics at uh, NYU, um, also a person of real professional stature. And his answer was the same. He was just very dismissive. But as I said, not because he was trying to promote the party line. As a scientist, he said, I remember this fellow's name, Danny Tranquina. He said, if there are many obvious social explanations for this lag in African-American performance, say, in math and science, and we might add the lag in performance of women in the top tier, the very top tier of math and science. He said, if there are very obvious social explanations, why do you bother now at this point to try to reach to biological explanations? And that, you know, seemed perfectly sensible to me. So uh, on the basis of conversing with people I consider knowledgeable and also very professional, I don't have an ideological ax to grind. On the basis of that, and I'm willing to humbly say that um, if they don't think there's any connection, why should I? If I did, in the face of what they're telling me, believe it, then it would be a prejudice. Which then brings us to your second question, which is not at the high level of science, but at the low level of personal experience. My personal experience is that, of course, everybody carries around with them prejudices, uh, not just when it comes to African Americans, when it comes to women, when it comes to uh, blonde haired, blue eyed women with large breasts. Everybody carries around with them carries prejudices with them. It would be hard to be, have grown up uh, or have yeah, grown in the soil of American society and not, and been immune to those prejudices. For me, the question is not whether you carry the prejudices, it's what you do with them. Do you acquiesce in them? Do you encourage them? Or do you fight them and struggle with them? That is to say, to keep reminding yourself, Norm, that's a prejudice. Norm, that's bigoted. Norm, you have no basis for really believing that. Or, Norm, give the guy a chance. Norm, give the girl a chance. You'll be, you might be surprised. So that to me is the, the critical question, not whether you carry around prejudice. Of course you do. The question is whether you encourage the prejudice, acquiesce in the prejudice, or fight against the prejudice. And in my own personal case, I'm confident in being able to say that I fight against it. And not only do I fight against it, but having been for a per portion of my life a uh, university professor, I've had very happy um, outcomes where I've had, I've, uh, I've, I became a mentor to some of my African American students. And uh, I have to tell you, and I know this sounds like a very politically correct uh, thing to say, uh, I have a couple of students and I read their stuff, they send it to me <clears throat> periodically. And I, I say to myself, you know, Norm, speaking honestly, that's better than you could have done at that age. Yeah, I discovered that. That's better. You know, sometimes, I say, oh, okay, no, I'm, you're being liberal. But then I stop short and say, no, I'm not being liberal. Objectively speaking, it's better than I could have done at that age. And of course, that's a very humbling and gratifying experience, um, which tells me <clears throat> uh, professors, if they come in with the right attitude, can do wonders in uh, facilitating success stories. Of course, at the end of the day, it's up to the student. I have a couple of students right now, they're not my students, but they're, uh, they're not my students any longer, but I continue to mentor them. And they really took to heart 
the things I said about you got to work hard. You got to read. You got to read quality literature. You can't take junk. You're not taking woke courses. You're taking literature and philosophy, and it's got to be serious. And you got to study what you read. You have to study the sentences, how they compose the sentence. You have to learn the vocabulary. Uh, and they became really, they became readers. They became readers, and they're damn good. So, uh, as I said, for me, the critical question is not whether or not you're racist, not whether or not you're prejudiced, not whether or not you're a bigot. The question is, what are you doing with that? How are you dealing with it? Of course, you have racist prejudice, so it would be ridiculous to think otherwise. Yeah, I wasn't even, uh, when I said the biology of race and racism, I wasn't even thinking about uh, questions of like race and IQ, race and intelligence. Uh, to me, they're just not only uh, silly, but but irrelevant, um, wrong. Uh, I'm more so thinking in terms of kind of a, your latter point in the sense that like when I, when I came, for instance, from Belarus, I was six years old, so I started first grade here. And I remember like my first interaction with with like black people. Uh, I was definitely nervous. I mean, being like six years old and growing up in Belarus, all you had were ethnic white people or people that looked ethnically Asian for the most part. So just physically being around somebody that you've never seen, a type, you know, a phenotype that you've never seen, your brain, just the way that the human brain is wired, you're, you're going to have some sort of knee jerk response. But very quickly, you know, being in a neighborhood where uh, a friend down the street is Egyptian, a friend down the block, he's he's Colombian, uh, another best friend, uh, half Italian, half Puerto Rican. Uh, other friends are black. Uh, by the time I reach uh, high school, I'm in a majority black high school. It becomes very difficult to just kind of go through those experiences with more prejudice than what you started with. Now, if you, on the other hand, and I think this is a much more salient to uh, D'Angelo and Kendi, uh, if you, on the other hand, are growing up uh, in a place where like your only interaction with non-whites is like maybe something that you see on TV, or uh, 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 just walking down, let's say, on occasion through housing projects, you're always going to have negative associations. And these negative associations are going to breed totally just like like clinically insane probability judgments. Like when Amy Wax says something like, it is rational to be fearful of a black male in an elevator. It's like, no, first of all, whatever she is in Yale or whatever uh, university, what are you going to be fearing from any male right in an elevator in that situation for you to really get rid of prejudice in, in in a kind of fundamental way you absolutely need some sort of program of desegregation you need to have people living amongst one another in positive contexts employment school just walking down the street uh so to get to d'angelo one thing that's fascinating is she begins actually her book with this like uh the first couple of chapters are an extended critique of structural racism and i find very little to disagree with but there is a kind of bait and switch where she sort of begins a little bit with questions of segregation and, and and you know the structural reasons for how things the way they are but very quickly she moves it over to well actually white person you individually right walking down the street or you you know in your workplace the responsibility is totally on you how do you feel around black people what can you do what kind of workshops can you participate in so that uh, we could sort of engineer this out of you it's never actually about what is a proper program of desegregation? What kind of tax regime must we have in place, right? What kind of, you know, crying will we see? Like, imagine like, imagine if we have like a true program of forced desegregation. Suddenly people that never want to live amongst one another, they're thrown in, right? And there's nothing they could do about it. 